On Friday, the 25th of February, while Trinidad and Tobago was preparing to celebrate one of the greatest festivals in the country, a tragedy was unfolding in Point of Pierre when five divers, including Faisal Kerban, Kazim Ali Jr., Rishi Nagasa, and Yusuf Henry and Christopher Budram became trapped in a pipeline in Point of Pierre. We're happy to have the lone survivor of that tragedy with us. Uh, I'd like to welcome Christopher Budram. Christopher, thank you for joining us and agreeing to speak to us. How are you? I'm okay. Thanks for having me and to publicize in this whole ordeal. First of all, let me send my deepest, express my deepest condolences to yourself and the families of your colleagues, uh, Faiz, Faisal Kerban, Kazim Ali Jr., Rishi Nagasa, and Yusuf Henry, who unfortunately, tragically passed away. Uh, between the 25th and some days later, we don't know exactly when, on that fateful day, unfortunately, uh, and, condol and condolences to you and their families. And I know this is a difficult uh, thing for you to talk about, so we really appreciate you taking time to speak to us today. One of the things I want to start with is, because of the scale of that tragedy, no one knows who Christopher Boudram is. No one knows who... Faisal Kerban is, no one really knows who Kazim Ali Jr. is, Rishi Nagasa and Yusuf Henry, except their families and close colleagues. So I'd like to start by asking, who is Christopher Budram? Tell us a bit about yourself. Well, I'm a, a normal man. Um, grew up in very humble beginnings. Um, married a lovely woman. Have three children with her. Um, work from scratch and build ourselves a nice home. You know, we work hard. Um, love the sea, love the, the ocean, love to dive, spearfish as hobbies, love cricket, love football. You know, um, at what age did you get into diving? At maybe around 14 years, I got into spearfishing and um recreational diving mm -hmm. and um at the age of i think around 21 i started commercial work uh, were you officially formally trained sorry were you formally trained in diving or did you did you yeah, get yeah. it yeah i was trained i was trained through party mm -hmm. right um now there's a new certification back then party was acceptable now um the i mean party is still acceptable because eh? there's no law saying that they can't do it it's just everything moving to the more advanced training which is um commercial imca suits and and yeah. at what age did you start or how long ago did you start working at lmcs i've been working for lmcs for a while maybe for about um 10 years now, but mm -hmm. but as a freelancer, you know, whenever I had diving jobs, they would call me in and work in the diving jobs and they um, recently for the, let me say, I think that was two or three months just before this job, I was offered a permanent position with the company. Um, and I then three months, two or three months after this happened. I think it was in October. October is when I was open, um, offered the, the permanent position. And the tragedy happened in February. And the tragedy happened in February, yeah. So give us a sense of who your colleagues were. Uh, Faisal Kerban, uh, Kazim Ali Jr., Rishi Nagasa, and Yusuf Henry. Who, who were these guys? Tell us about them. Well, Faizi. Faizi was Faizi. Faizi um, also is um my cousin um he is a very skilled knowledgeable person in life and in on the job um he was a person never to say no always smiling you have a smile at why you see that smile you can never forget it you know always always smiling Even, even if you tell you something bad, you will still smile and laugh it off. That's the kind of person you was. You know, never looking for confrontation or anything like that. Was he married with children? Yes, he's he's married. Um his wife named Felicia Furban. 
He has three children with her. Um, Nicholas Kurban and Michael Kurban. Michael Kurban is um, well. Both Nicholas and Michael was um, on the site when it happened. Yeah, Nicholas is the one actually made um, a call to his brother Michael, and Michael and his team is the one actually um, assist me in bringing me out the pipeline. And um, and Michael went back in to try to see if he could against that. Well, attempted. Our condolences yeah. to his wife and children. And give us a sense of who Kazim Ali Jr. was. Kazim Ali Jr. Kazim Ali Jr. was um he was spontaneous. Um off work. He was fun, off work, on work. You know, he was the dad's he was he was the boss son, so you know, you had to step up to that. He was still on work. Um a responsible young man. He was about, I think, age 36, yeah, when it happened. He was um, a responsible person, take his job very seriously. Um, he was a kind person. When he needed to be, when he needed to be stern, he, he was stern also, you know. Um, Did he have to run? Yeah, you have one child. Um, that's Ada Moore. It's her name. It's a girl. Mm -hmm. Um. She is, I think she is four years. Yeah, she's four years right now. She's a baby. Um, and what about Rishi Nagasa? Who was Rishi? Rishi, Rishi Nagasa. Rishi Nagasa was our good friend. He was, wow. Hmm, that's bringing back so much our feelings and memories. Huh? He was a, a good friend. He was a husband. He was a father. He also have a son. Who is about um four years also. Um his son name is um slip my mind. Um I'll get back, I'll tell his son yes now. Um mm -hmm. but yeah, he has a son. Um he is a trustworthy friend. He he's a person all is like to work safe. If he see her doing the slightest thing off the books, you know, he'd have pull up on you. you know, he was comical when he needed to be. You know, he was a good friend. Mm -hmm. And and a what hard, about hard working you, person? And what about Yusuf Henry? Oh, Yusuf. Yusuf is my boy. Yusuf was the life of the party. Yusuf would make a rainy day feel like sunshine. You know, he should make anybody laugh. You know, easy man to start the dance, you know, get the things rolling, you know, get, get, get the vibes when you come to work and you're feeling down and tired, you meet yourself, you're ready to go again, you know, that's the man to get the thing going. Your, your, your yeah. whole being, your whole face, your whole expression lights up talking about them now. You, you seem to have been a really close-knit group, would that be correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yusuf also has um four children yeah four children yeah um, how have you been doing since since the loss of your friends i'm just surviving i was just surviving, surviving. i'm not even half the person i was i can't even have fun with my kids without a constant reminder or something did you no. receive counseling at all? Um, I did counseling, yeah. Um, my own private counseling. Um, I still do it. Uh, whenever I could um afford it now, you know. But when it now happened, I was as regular as I could be. Now I had to kind of watch my finances, but yeah. have you been able to work since the tragedy? Since since the aftermath of the tragedy. Sorry, have I been able to? Have you been able to work at all? No, no. I I don't have the strength and the well, mental strength and, and and zeal. So I just not intention of that. It's real hard for me to know that in the industrial in our industrial world 
you, you had to go and do play, you had to do orientations, you have to do safety meetings and all these things telling you that when you do this, when you reach on the job, make sure and sign a GSA, make sure and go by a toolbox meeting, make sure and do a safety briefing in case that anything will happen, you know, you're covered. Well, something did happen. Something did happen and nobody had get covered. You know? We're, I've we're been to hell. In, inside that pipe is like, is, is like everything you could close here and think as hell to be, that's inside that pipe is. We're going to take a short break and come back and talk about that particular day in question, that Friday, the 25th of February, where your world and the families of your colleagues were turned upside down. We take a short break and come back with more with Christopher Boudram. We're speaking to Christopher Boudram, the lone survivor of the what has now come to be known as the Paria diving tragedy. Christopher, again, we thank you for talking to us. On, on that day, walk us through the start of your shift on that day. What, what time would you have picked up work? Is it a is it a birth or a platform that you would have worked on before? Give us some details about the start of that day. Okay, so on the start of that day, our supervisor, Dexter Guerrero, um, and um, and Andrew Farah both asked us to come out early, you know, so we could um, reach on the job a little early and prepare, right? So normally I'm, I'm living like about three minutes away from Faria, right? So normally I would get up, do my exercise, and leave home like around five to seven, and I'll be there for seven. But normally we pick up work for seven. On this day, the access to reaching for six. So five to six, I leave home, came across there, about maybe 10 past, yeah, about 10 past six or 20 past six, we, we, we left shore on the barge. We went across the boot. That's like about maybe 45 minutes traversing on the water, you know? Um, we reached there, it was a rainy day. All over this school. We start having safety meetings as as usual, you know, nothing in the front. We go through our safety meetings, we go through our toolbox. We do what we have to do, we say our prayers every time we go to work, we say our prayer um, every time after we finish we do our, our safety we finish, I think we say our prayers, ask God Almighty to protect us, guide us. And we went and this is 6 a.m. or 6 p.m.? We start our job, we set up. Yeah, yeah. And um, after this all the meetings and, and, really and, and... Yeah, and after all the meetings and we set up... And maybe like around 8, 8 to 10 water and then all of us, we entered the water. We got, we got our instructions, went in the water and start our job. And what did this job entail, generally? What were you required to do that day? Okay, so we were we were required to um, we had to okay we had to take off a a blank of the thirty inch line, right? Um, take off the blank take out the mechanical plug, then take out an inflatable plug, all right? And then join the two lines together, the right that they make one, all right? Because what we were doing was we, we cut off the old half, the old piece of the riser, all right, to join a, a new piece, all right? Because the older piece from 15 feet and above going up were um, rusted. Right? Is, this, and, is yeah. this something you would have done before? Is this something yeah. you were accustomed to have done before? Yeah. So you've, exactly. done, you've done this before. This was routine yeah. for you. You've done it before. 
Well, um, I wouldn't say exactly routine, but it's something that we're familiar with. I've done before. It was like the third or fourth time we did this type of job. Um, so yeah, I, doing. Let me let me rephrase that. Is routine the way we just do on on land or or on on a flat surface under the water on the seabed under the water? Well, that routine, right? What, what what wasn't um like an everyday thing is doing it in the the hyperbaric chamber or in the the um the habitat right so that was that, that was a different circumstance about this time around you were in a chamber which is a kind of created environment for you to do the work inside right now saying that is not the first time I do, we do it inside the habitat or in the chamber it, it's actually the fourth time we're doing this job the same type of job, four, sorry, two to four times. So, so you're going about the job that you're accustomed doing, and when did and everything is going according to plan, what you're accustomed to. When did you realize something was going wrong at all, if at all? Okay, so um, let me get some background story on this job. Okay. On this job, I um, I had COVID. Right, I'd gotten COVID and it was really bad. Um, so I'd take some leave from work. Right, all this time they were prepping the line and doing all the pre dives for the job. Right, um, right after COVID, my mom passed. Right, um, so I took sorry, additional sorry. thanks. So I took additional leave because of the passing of my mom and um. The day of this incident was the second day of me being on the job and the first day being on this particular job. Because prior to the, the prior to, to this job, the company had other jobs doing, right? And the, the company, which is Paria, also was starting and stopping this job between windows, because whenever they have a, a, a vessel coming in to load or offload, the job will be put on a hole. All right? So it's between windows, we'll be doing this particular job. So it was the second day for me on the job, right? Um, and the first day on this particular job, since I back out, right? Would so, it be accurate if the job would have been started like the 24th or some days before that? If oh, you this, joined this job this job had been started i think it's three months before this okay yeah because it's only in windows we are able to to work my okay. guess two days by three days you know whenever the whenever the ship not full in production is paria number one cool you know so they must they must stop in nothing for production right after this accident they even quarantine the the site production all again so you were back on in that day mm -hmm. and you no, would see of the this job. ships was coming in yeah so um we so i didn't know i wasn't there fully prepping you know for the job i just get filled in and they let me know well all right so the Normally what we do, right, when we pump, when we, we pump out enough fuel, right, to clear the area we're working for, right, and enough fuel now, huh? we pump out flush, you know, normally when, right, mm -hmm. to clean, like to clean the line, and then you put the, you leave the flush up to the level you need, and then you put a plug on top of the flush. All right, the plug does work as a leg to support the, the flush does work as a leg to support the plug. All right, the liquid inside it. So I assumed right that everything was done as usual. All right, as the standard, as there was the liquid there, there was the plug on top of the liquid, and so when I came, all these things were already installed, right. So the day on that day, the job was to take out these things and install the next half of the riser, right? 
So in in this job, at this job, because I now come in and now falling back into the job, I wasn't on the front line of the job. Like, you know, I was like taking um, orders. Okay, Chris, we want this done. We want to do this. And I do that because they know I'm capable. They know I, I know what I'm doing. You understand? But because I wasn't in the forefront of the job, I had to take a back. See? So on that day when we went in, Faizi was the, the, um, the lead diver. Faizi said, Chris, we need to take off the blank. Yusuf and I took, took the blank off. We had some rigging inside there to, because the blank is 30 inch, but it's steel, half inch steel. So it's not something you could easily lift out with your hand. So you'd have to hook it up on some rigging, pick it up with the chain buck, manually lift it off, manually rest it down on the side, bolt it up so you don't fall or damage anyone. After taking off that blank, right? Picture the, a blank as a big baking stone, right? Mm -hmm. with, some, with, with a series of bolts. Bull tools right there, up, right? So that's more or less the blank. All right, we take that off, and then we have a mechanical plug. The mechanical plug works with a series of bolts also. And it tighten it, there's a rubber inside, expands and hug against the inner diameter of the pipe, the diameter of the pipe, and, and locks it, right? The purpose of a mechanical plug is for when you're doing hot work or any type of work, no debris cannot fall and damage the inflatable plug, which is underneath that. All right? So that is the first barrier. That is a barrier to protect the, the inflatable plug. So we have to slacken this out, use the same again, take it out, same procedure, bolt it up at the side of the, the habitat to make sure it's safe, and then deflate the inflatable plug. All right? That is... um. That was fifth, five feet, sorry. That was five feet down <clears throat> from the top at the flange where we was working in. There was a hose coming up with a valve to release the air. All right? Um, and that's where it starts. That's where it starts. Um, so after we taken out all of that, Blacks, um, Dabi Rishi, Rishi asked for um, a crescent to release the air because the valve was a bit damaged while mm -hmm. taking it out, something knock it or damage it. So we send um, for a crescent wrench, Kazimali Jr. At the same time, he, he came in to the chamber to ask how we go in. You know, he was as a safety diver outside. Come to make sure everybody in the right thinking sense and mind because we're dealing in a dangerous environment, confined space. So every now and again, he would come and check us. So he was supervising you know? the operation. Correct. Mm -hmm. So he came, check us. We tell him we need a spanner. He went back, he got the spanner, a crescent wrench on the badge, bring it back for us. I take it from him. I give it to Rishi. And, um, uh, after handing to Rishi and walking off, coming back to, to Kazim, Rishi started inflating the inflatable plug, deflating the inflatable plug. And that is where it all happened. It just gets sucked in. What, what exactly happened? Yeah. So, so that happened. Did you feel the pull into the plug, into the pipeline? Did you? Was it a violent pull? Was it a slow pull where you could try to resist the pull? How did it actually unfold? Okay, so I just see the water level inside the 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 chamber I just start to rise. As it start to rise, I say, yo guys, this thing filling up. Let me get out of here. Right? And I jump off the platform into the water. When I jump, instead of feeling gravity pulling me down, I felt like if everything come up to me like gravity just pours for a second you know and this was the water everything gushing coming up so i still wasn't sure what happened you know 
I just grab onto something. Before I could grab onto anything, I just feel like a tornado inside it. You know, it was just everything spinning, everything hitting you. You're getting slammed around. I was able to snatch it. Snatch onto something and then something heavy hit me on my head. After that, all I remember is crouching in a, in a fetus position to protect my head and my body. I didn't even feel getting sucked into the pipe. And here's the thing between the pipe and the riser that we had to join, the two spools to join and to, to make one, it was maybe like about 24 inches to 30 inches apart from each other. And that's what everybody passed you. That's so the, the force of the suction, when the differential occurred, the pressure dif differential occurred, is what created the vortex of water and sucked everything, including you all inside the pipe. Yes. Yes. Wow. And, 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 and did that, did that ahead, take sorry. a long time? Because you said you felt yourself when you jumped into the water being swirled around and things hitting you. Did you see your colleagues at all at that time? Were you bouncing into them? They were feeling, were they feeling the same thing? No, that happened in an instant. That happened in an instant. I, how I relate it to you maybe sound like if, but it happened so quick. I didn't even feel when I get sucked in the pipe, you know? It was just like, bam, bam, bam. And you just had to feel yourself getting pelt down. Like, but I feel like if I was going like, oh, Hundred miles or maybe more. And for those listening, this is a vertical pipe, and you're going in the part that's going down, right. not the part that you're running on top. The part that's going down, in further down into the depths. Yeah, sixty feet down. Sixty and feet down. It's only when I felt the elbow, which is a few seconds after I get pulled in, is when I realized I'm inside the pipe. Because I feel the elbow, and I just feel my body just from horizontal. From vertical to horizontal. Now this is a thirty-inch pipe. Yeah. So it's not a really big pipe. It's a little less than thirty-six, which is a yard, right? Yeah. So were you were you outstretched at that point, or were you still in the fetal crouch position? <laughs> to tell you the truth, I don't know. I, I remember. I, the only thing I know. While I was in that pipe, when I realized I was in the pipe, I tried pushing my hands to the side of the walls of the pipe to try and stop myself from going further in. You know, because I honestly thought I alone was in the pipe. Mm -hmm. I still didn't figure out how I get in the pipe or what happened. If it had an explosion outside, I didn't know what caused the accident at the time. You know, I just know. I was flying straight in and I realized I was in the pipe. So I tried all so of to slow myself down. At that point, you realize I'm in trouble. Yeah. yeah. And this is serious. So at that point, were you, were you past the elbow point into the horizontal lower 60 feet? The, the yeah. horizontal part of 60 feet, you were in that point? Yeah. yeah. I at was, what uh, point did you, wait, did you stop or slow down? Did, did you bounce into equipment, your colleagues? What happened at that point? No, I, I, I just gradually slowed down. And while I slowed down, the, 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 the gush of water starts slowing down too. You know, so when, when the energy died off of, of, with the suction, I, start my, I just start to slow down. But at this time, it's nearly like two minutes, you know, out of breath. My, my chest, when you're holding your breath for long, you just hear your, your lungs forcing your body to try to, to open your airways. You just actually hear your chest going. And, 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 and after that, you know, just start to feel like if you want to black out. I was on that stage. And all of a sudden, in my mind, I just tell myself, well, Father Lord, open them gates, sir, man. Say, ma, coming home. Did you have any breathing apparatus or were you, were you holding your breath? No, I was on a breath hold. Uh, no, we had, after I come into the, the chamber and do, to, to, to perform the duties, you had to take off your, 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 your diving apparatus. The only thing we had on was our wetsuits, and that's it, and a pair of gloves. 
So you are in this pipe now, holding your breath after what could be approximately two minutes of being sucked down and you're able to stop. What goes through your mind? So you said you, you think you're going to die because you're praying yeah. to God to open yeah. the doors, yeah. hoping, yeah. hoping your mother welcomes you into heaven. Mm -hmm. What happened at that point? Because you, certainly you didn't die, fortunately, thank God. As, as soon as that, 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 that thought run through my mind, and I say, Mom, I come in home, I just feel my body get pushed out of the water, like, I now reach the end of the water into our air pocket. And I just, my body automatically just, <gasps> now I can't see anything, you know? Although I feel any water, my whole body numb and tingling, your whole body. It's so hard to explain, but your body does go on a, on a, on a hyper drive, you know? My, my, my ears ringing off, my body stinging, feeling numb right around, and I don't know how automatically my body knew I was in air and I was able to catch open my mouth and take a breath, and, <gasps> and I was coughing and breathing in between because uh, the, the all the way was in an air pocket, it still had fumes from the oil that was trapped around the wall and floating in the water and things. So, you know, that burn in your eyes, it burn in your nose. So you what's know? in this pipe? Water, slush, and, and air, the air pocket. What's in this space here with you now? Okay, okay so, yeah, like, I'd like about maybe um, 18 inches of water in this, this area where I, where I stopped and was able to, to catch my breath. Like, about 18 inches of water on my back. All right? Um... Oil all over, oil on my face, oil on my hand, oil on my gloves, everything just gunky and, and sticky. You know? Um the air, you try opening your eye, your eyes burning you, you it's pitch black in any case, even if your eyes open or closed, but it's it, it more comfort to your eyes when it closed. You know? Anyhow you can't see anything. So my your eyes closed, you're wiping your hand, your your eyes for thinking that it might help you see and it's just more oil you're feeling. It's like all the oil that was over the years inside the pipe that stick around the pipe. It's, it's like a gunk. You know? And it's all over you. I stopped what, what, think, what, thinking did what you to do. Realize, you said a while ago we were in there. So at what point did you realize your colleagues were in this air pocket with you? Or were they? About, about maybe... Maybe 15, 20 minutes after, because when, when I reach you now, no, not so long, like about five minutes after, yeah. Because after I reach in, I stop, try to get my bearings, try to slow down my breathing, you know, compose myself. I was, I know, now, now happened, I was in a type of panicking mood, you know, calm myself down, tell myself, Chris, you know, let's get out of this, you gotta calm yourself and figure out what to do, where it is, how you come in, what direction I'm in. Because after coming out the pipe, you could think about all the logical reasons. But when you're inside and in in the whole action of everything, you know, it's like you had to hold back your mind at all time from running away from you. You can understand what I mean. But you're, because, going, you're going to self-preservation instincts. Yeah. Yeah, and, and at and at any point of time, negative thoughts run into your mind and you have to just hold back yourself from thinking in that area. You know, you just have to keep positive and that's like something hard to do in that situation. Because you know, you know as a diver, you know, you know as somebody who in this type of work experience enough, you know that your, your, your chances of getting out is less than 1%. That was the reality, you know. So, did, at that point, did you know exactly where you were, or had an idea that you would suck down into the the horizontal past the L? You knew where you were. Yeah, yeah. I didn't know you how knew, you far knew how I was in. Was. I didn't know how far I was in, but I know I was inside the pipe, and and I wasn't even sure what direction I came in from. You know, and um. So after sitting and trying to calm myself and think, I started to hear a voice now. 
and then I hear in somebody saying, Hey, hey, I will buy it, I will buy it. I say, Who is that boy? Who is that boy? The person say, I hear boy, look, I hear boy. Sorry about that. The, 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 the person say, I hear, look, I hear, look, I hear. And I thought they were outside, you know, because inside that pipe, when they shout, we even started talking normally here in each other like if we right here because everything is echoing and you know you're not sounding like if you're fast. So I think well okay, I may be right next to the to the elbow, you know, and them guys right on top, they go drop a line for me and tick me up I'll alone get pulling the pipe, you know. So I start going towards the voice. Whose voice was it? It sung like Kazimali voice. It was Kazimali's voice. Junior. And as I start going towards it, I realized that my ankle either broke or damaged bad. I thought it was broken. And my left hand was either broken or damaged bad too. Right? It was in a lot of pain. I couldn't really move it. So I said, all right, Chris, this is just how it is. You have to suck up this pain and keep going. And as I started to get closer, I started to hear the voices clearly now. And he's saying that I'm inside the pipe, I'm inside the pipe, boy, hello, oh, save man, please come and save man. I say, Oh, who is that? Who is that? Because he said, Me, I say, Me, who? Say, Kaz, boy, Kaz. Say, Kaz. Say, All right. I come in to meet you now, Kaz. I come in. I'll drop down a rope for me. All in the pipe too. He say, yeah, in the pipe, boy, in the pipe. I say, oh shit. Did you hear everybody uh, else's voice? It was it was everyone of you? Everyone? All four others? No. No, no, I didn't hear. The only voice I didn't hear was Rishi's voice. Right? I wanna ask um I heard Yusuf. I say, Yusuf, is that you? He say, yes, Chris is me. I say, all right. He said, no, my leg broken. He said, all right, Yusuf. I hear Faizi start a ball in the background. I said, Faizi, what happened, Faizi? What happened? Faizi said, nothing. I said, damage? He said, no, I'm not damaged. He said, okay. I said, but like, Blacks, Blacks is the lucky one. He, he didn't get sucked in. And then Yusuf told me, yes. Blacks get sucked in, boy. I feel him up there, but like, he unconscious. I feel him breathing, but he not responding. I tell him, well, all right, well, we can't do nothing about blocks right now. We got to come back for him. I say, but what direction we got to go? I feel I have to go foot first, right? To, to, because I feel like if I came in head first, and they was like, no, 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 no. The guarantee show we got to go the next way. We got to go the direction I now came from. So I'm sure they say yes. So well, all right. In any case, I can't do nothing about it. I just had a trust earlier, and it's three other saying it's the same direction. So I said, all right, let's go. Um, cousin tell me he can move. So I said, okay, put your arms underneath my, on top of my legs, you know, and, and um, I'll take my foot and put it between your shoulders. And I go try and pull it. I say, Yusuf, try and push. Kaz, Faizi, you try and push. Yusuf and all that we go make a chain and try and get on with this thing and, and get out of here. Everybody agreed. I say a prayer with everybody before we leave. And then we went. So you 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 actually spoke to three of the four men who were in there and you started a self-mounted rescue effort for yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you were you going in the right direction? Yes. Yes. Thank God for those guys. Because if I was there if I was there by myself, I might have been going the, the wrong direction. Who was closest to the exit at that point? 
I. So which means you got sucked in last, would that be correct? Yes. Yes. And and did you have to turn your body around to go in that direction in the 30 inch pipe or, or were you already in the right direction? Your your was head already, was Yeah, already my head was facing the correct direction. But what happened um, that point? so so from there we link up and and, and we start a start a move. It was slow. It was hard because the pipe was completely dry at this point. Conked. Conked with one set of old oil. So you can have traction that you, you would want to try to get a car gear because you're slipping, you're skating. You know? Uh, we push, we pull, we push, we pull. Cousin Junior started to cry and ball out for pain. We had to stop him. We had to ask. I had to ask God for strength. We stopped. We prayed. I asked everybody to say a prayer. Yusuf prayed with me. We go again. Right? God was the one that had all of, of us there. You're tired. You're injured. You're low on oxygen because it's in a, it's in an air pocket. So how far did this air pocket extend to? Because, you know... At at some point, if it's an air pocket, it's going to end. Right. So, it it up the way I reach, what well, were well, well, good way. I, I can't really give you a specific on how big the air pocket was because, to tell you the truth, I wasn't focused on on that at the time. You know, I was trying to focus on more self preservation, trying to get them fellas out of it. Them fellas out there panicking. I also had to pray and talk with them. Um, small cousins and a lot, a lot, a lot of pain. And we, we always had to stop for him. You know, at that time, we say he couldn't make it again, that we're going to die. And I had to, to encourage him. We had to talk to him. I had to tell him, yo, we'll get out of this. God is good. Do say that. Do say we're going to die because, you know, your tongue are power. Can't do this. So all of you were interlocked and crawling away, attempting to crawl your way out of this pipe. Yeah. And you know you're on the horizontal part, so you know there's an elbow to cross and a vertical part to go up. Yep. What happened? What happened as you continued? As we continued, um, the water levels had arise, so that is the air pocket coming, you know, gradually tying. After realizing the water pocket, you know, start to end, I um, I realized that we're gonna reach a point that we can't go no more. Right after thinking that, I end up feeling a, a, a diving tank. You know, uh, oh, Faisi had, had got a diving tank way back to the back. You know, he had found that diving tank and he said, Chris, you have one. And then I find one. And then we and um, small cars start to share it because it, your throat burning, you know, you're, you're actually feeling that this air we breathe in, it's breathable, but it's not livable. You know what I mean? We we have a time frame in breathing this. You can get nitrogen, narcosis, all kind of different type of sickness from breathing in all of this. So, when we get us here, we start body breathing it. Me and small cars start to breathe. Um, Faizi and Yusuf start to body breathe. We wasn't breathing much. We were just taking a sip in between so we could, you know, get some nice clean air to keep we, we, we energies up. So because we know we have to reserve this these tanks, these two tanks, for when we reach other places in the pipe. When we reach a position now that we couldn't go no more because we had like about maybe six inches of air from the top of the pipe to my nose. It was like six inches of air, five back, but he had like about 18 inches. All right? So we was able to detect that the water coming down in an angle. And um, from there, we had to go further. We had to, um, I had to go in front to see, I told them, 
listen, let me go in front. Let me check out, you know, how far this water pocket is, if there's an next um, air pocket where, you know, maybe we could body breathe it one tank and, and reach the next air pocket. You know, at first, Kazim was reluctant in, in, in letting go. go. It was like, Chris, no, don't go, don't leave him. I said, bro, I'm not leaving him. I'm coming back. I just go and check it out and come back. So I took the tank. I went in. I swim a good way and realized, like, there's no end to this. That I know for a fact two persons wouldn't be able to body breed in this distance and survive. I came back, telling fellas we can't go through that together again. Small cats grab onto my foot and say, Chris, don't leave me, don't leave me. I say, cats, I have to go forward, bro. I just go in. I will get help. I will come back. I say, by now, I can't teach you and you may be halfway down in this line looking for us. You know, um, Plus, they go have a whole heap of divers there. And all this, all this I tell him, because it's just something to comfort him, but I myself wasn't sure. Because I don't even know if upstairs was an explosion. You know, the boat had an explosion and caused all of this. We don't know what happened. We don't know what's going on. I don't know if up there is bare fire. You know? But just to keep he and Yusuf calm, you know? Tell them to worry. Them fellas could be the only way I rescued and happening, you know? Kazim didn't want to tell I go my foot. I said, Kazim, you need to let go my foot. You need to let me go forward. She can't do it. I pray with him. I said, bro, let go my foot. He was reluctant on letting go my foot. I said, okay, I wasn't going anywhere, and I just wait until he kind of ease up on. Yeah, I'm going to force you to hold my foot, and I pull out my foot quickly. You know, kind of, kind of kicking off him off my foot. And I tell Faizy while doing that, I say, Faiz, um, you need to come too. And I just went. I swim for maybe like about an hour, one and a half. No, no. Maybe like about half an hour. Yeah. Maybe like about half an hour swimming. Till I reach our next air pocket. I reach the next air pocket. I catch my breath. I hear them guys bawling and screaming. You know, still panicking and making noise as I left them. Because the water, the water may not been full straight straight to the pipe where the are still here. Hear them bowling, Chris, 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 wait, do go, wait, do go. And I'm like, I'm coming back for you, I'm coming back for you. I swear, I will never leave all here. I'm coming back for you. I just go in and get help and come back. And I just, from there, I just start to move. Start to move as fast as possible to come out. Somewhere in that air pocket, I hear Faisy calling me. Christopher, Christopher. Yeah, Faiz. Wait now, boy. Wait for me now, boy. Wait now, boy. Say, Faiz, I can't wait. I can't stop, Faiz. I can't stop. If I stop, I might die. I can't stop. I had to keep going. Come on, me. Come on, me, Faiz. Keep going. Tell us how to feel the water filling back up now. This this air pocket will, will not totally empty as the last one we was in. This one was like um, halfway emptied. Um, it was a bit easier to move in. And um, when I realized the, the water filling up again. Uh, Oh, shucks, I forget that. Forget that, I'm really drunk in, in the last, 
in the last the last swim before I come to the before I came to the before I came to the pocket mm -hmm. the tank that I left with emptied and I dropped it and I start swimming and while I swimming I start feeling all around for a tank I just start keep swimming and in between that space of time I run out I run out of here my throat sat back making the next noise started to get weak like I want to black out and Maybe in the last couple of seconds, my hand just chopped on a, a, a tank. And I just I chopped that tank and put it in my mouth. The, the regulator was full of oil. Oil now inside my mouth. All in my, my lip, my tongue, everything is oil. I taste in oil on my teeth. And I, and I just blew it out and I started breathing. And then from there I came all the water. And I reach high up to the next one now, and Faizi was like, just wait for me. I stop and I ask Faizi if he have it. Faizi tell me, yes, yeah, Chris, I have it, wait for him. I say, Faizi, if you have it, I can't wait, I go it. At what point like, did you reach the elbow? What, what did you think when you were, when you got to the elbow? So right right after that, I may be swimming for like about 10, 15 minutes again, and then I meet the elbow. And I meet the elbow, I was frightened. I was. These were I wanted to meet this elbow, but when I meet it now, is when the reality hit a. Who are going to meet on top? If I going to, if this going to be at boot five, which is the wrong direction, and there's a blank. Blocking you know, your exit. Yeah. So if this is boot six, and on top is pure fire. You know. Or everything just collapsed and blocking it, the exit again. You know, these with death become real again because from the time leaving them and, 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 and traversing in the pipe, you know, you, you gain yourself, you get some hope in that space of time coming across because you're moving. You know? When I reached our elbow, it was like, boy. So now you reach this elbow and you know. You have to go up 60 feet in a slippery environment. Was there water in, in that upward uh, portion, that vertical portion, or it, was it air? Tank fleet was water. Tank fleet was water. So I was able to, to not properly swim, but more like a swim, climb kind of thing. You know? Like um. You like could use the board. The, the boy and see the body to get you up. Yeah, like a kind of frog motion, climbing and swimming. Yeah, up. And when I reach up, when I when I when I, when I reach up now, is air. So I get a relief. I get my <gasps> start to breathe. I felt around, felt around. I feel one of the chain block from one of the the lifting apparatus we had was swinging. I was able to snatch onto that and hold up my body weight. But um, the the chamber was dry. It was pumped out. So it was like about three feet from the top of the flange. Now remember, my left hand damaged, my, my, my left ankle damaged. So climbing and you, and you're, out. And you're exhausted at this point. Yeah, totally exhausted. My mind was like, I was mentally and physically exhausted you know I, I started to break down after i try about five six times to try and climb out i started to break down because i, I right here I right here the frustration I, I, I coming so fast and just to climb off this three feet pull myself out i can't do it physically can't do it it was so mind blowing and, and I just break down right in. I started a ball and cry and then you know it came to me boy knock knock this chain block chain and ball and call out for help from there and I just had to knock and ball and scream. Knock and ball and scream and maybe twenty minutes to half twenty minutes to half an hour doing that. I hear somebody a final voice. I hear them, I hear them. Look at here and them all here, and then I started hearing 
a pong in oi, pong, 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 it my tree pong. I hit them back tree pong, 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 pong. To make sure they know it is not nothing, just swing in there. Then the pong two times, pong, pong, like them back two again, pong, pong. They my five pongs, like them five, they my tree, like them three. And they do not ride through. And then, then I started hearing the pongs getting louder. Then I just, it just stopped. Bam. I pong in and ball in and I don't hear nothing again. All of a sudden, I just see a light coming out. Because every, every now and again, I use them a last strength. I still, although, although I try all that time and I pong in, every time I get back some strength in my body, I, I'm trying to pull up, you know, to get myself. The other time, I hook my chin on the flange and I'm trying to pull up with one hand and, and my next hand trying to get it over, but I couldn't raise this hand up to get it on the flange. And while trying to do that, I just see a light flickering coming up. Boy, that was the most scariest light I ever see. Because at this stage, my mind starting to play tricks on me. I think, I, I don't know if I, if this is hell, if I'm dead, if, if this is the journey to hell, to heaven. I don't know. My mind just started to go crazy in that little space of time. And the light just started to get brighter and brighter. You know? And I just started to come back down in the water and crumble up. And this, this person looked more like a demon to me because you have one, a full hoodie. You can't see his face. You just see a bright light. I remember my eyes burning. I could barely see to her. You know? And I just seen this bright light with this with this dark shadowy figure coming out. And I was like, boy, who's that boy? Who's that boy? And then he said, boy, me, boy, me. I said, me, who are you? He said, Roland, boy, Roland. He said, Roland, who are you? He said, Ramuta, boy. I said, Rolly, that you? He said, yeah. I said, boy, take what I'm asking. I'm going to see your face, boy. And take it off. And I said, oh, gosh, boy, brother, boy. Thank God, boy. Save me for me, and I, boy. Please save me, get me out of here. And, I, and he, was, he was like, yeah. So now, on the platform outside, to the top of the rise, that is like five feet, right? The individual I'm talking about is maybe like about five foot three in height, you know? So it's just more or less he chin over the top, right? So he was able to, you know, throw up his chest up on, on it and, and hold me. And he still didn't have the, the leverage or the strength to, to pull him out from there because of the height on the outside. So he told me, Chris, I had to leave you. I had to go and get some other help. But I said, no, boy, but I don't leave me now. But he said, Chris, I had to leave you. I said, all right, boy. Too quick, please. So he was and the I only one that exit there waiting or looking. Yeah. Who came when they hear the noise? That was the diver who now came as Ronald Ramuta. And... In the as as soon as he let me go back because he was going to get see if he get somebody else to come in. Because remember at the time on top, the Coast Guard and Paria officials were stopping individuals from coming into the water. Right? So when he come at the same time he saw Corey coming up. Corey McField. Right? He's our next colleague colleague of us <coughs> of ours. He came in now. He's like about six something. Um, a strong guy. All right. Came up, boom, with 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 he and, and um Ronald Ramuta. Both of them was able to pull me out of, of the pipe easily. You know, the the game out. The um, the time I let me go. Ask me if I alright first. I said not really, but I good enough to swim. You know, really said, ask me if I need help to swim. I said, no, I'm good to swim. Could go out there. He said, okay. He tell Corey to take me out. And he would stay here to see if anybody else coming back. Because I told him five. He was right behind me. All right? Um, but I said, no. I said, first, go and ask Andrew Farah how long I was down here. I need to know how long I was down here. Because I could get decompression sickness. All right. What time was that when they rescued you? Pulled you out of the of, of the of the tank of the, the pipe. 
I, I believe it was um, minutes to six. I think it was like um, two or three minutes to the hour or quarter to six somewhere around there. In the evening. And this is the Friday in, evening. In the evening, Friday evening. Um, so you literally spent about nine hours down there. No, from nine yeah, I check it. Yeah, I check it from like um half past one is the time we re enter the water. Right. Okay, all right. Yeah. Because we had a break. We came out, we took lunch. Just over, just, just over five hours. Yeah. Um but in diving you have you have um certain time to stay at certain depths. Right? And if you cross that, you'll get something called Decompression sickness, the bends. The bends. The bends. Now this 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 could range from a small lash, or what we call a lash. This could range from a from a small little hit, where you're just feeling pain in your joints, to death. Depends on how long you stay and how deep you went and all these kind of things, right? A lot of variables in it. So, the the dive supervisor normally log your dive. Right, and he will calculate how long you should be in water. All of you that I you would be calculating it too, you know. But the dive supervisor will calculate how long you're supposed to be in the water and with the safe time for you to be in the water and if you need any safety stuff, etc. Right? right, we were deep, we were working in a no decompression dive zone, dive depth. Right, meaning that we didn't need to decompress in this depth, right. At the 15 feet, we could have spent whole day working there. But because I've been sucked in a pipe, right, is where the, and we went 60 feet down, right, is where, where the problems come in. Put a pause. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break and we're going to come back with more of Christopher Bodram. Stay with us. We're back with Christopher Bodram. We're talking about. His harrowing ordeal, surviving what has now come to be known as the Paria driving diving tragedy. So you are uh, pulled out and you make it back to shore, and you're telling, I guess, whoever else is there, uh, that uh, Faisi is right behind you, and you know other divers are alive in the pipe. What's happening at that point? Well, um, I didn't make it back to shore yet. I was on the barge. They, they came out, I was on the badge. Um, a lot of commotions, everybody was, you know, wasn't sure what was going on, what happening, you know. A lot of people was glad to see me. I was in a lot of pain. I told them, yo, them guys down there, they live in. I'll go get them, go get them. You know, uh, everybody was like in shock. I see Nicholas, I see Michael, that's right, you two sons. I say, yo, I left father right behind me. Go and get him now. He right he was right behind me. Go and get him now. You understand? I'll stop watching me and go quick. Because Michael, you know you know that their time is limited because of what you went through. You know that the clock is ticking on their lives. Yes. Yes. Was there a sense of urgency to go back in at all? What, what were people telling you? Was the Coast Guard there? Were Pari officials there? Or was it your colleagues alone there? The, the Coast Guard was there. My colleagues were there. But I think when I came out, the, the, the Coast Guard was a bit confused at what was going on now. Pari, everybody was a bit confused because before that, they, they, they came to a conclusion that everybody inside the pipe died. You understand? But when they see me come out now, the whole narrative should have changed. You understand? For Paria, it did not. But the Coast Guard, to my belief, you know, they start to, you know, think twice about the orders they got to stop people from rescuing. So they were kind of confused. And within that space of time, Michael was able to to take advantage of because I said curl with Michael. I want to know why is he hesitating. If I tell you father right there, why you hesitated this time and I didn't know at that time that the Coast Guard had them on that gunpoint and telling them they want nobody to enter any water. You understand? On Paria's orders. Alright? 
So remember, I that information I didn't know. So I was like, why is you know I don't I tell you a fire in water and you have you are jumping out water yet? You, you understand? So I I I, I cursed them. I said, by go in the effing water and get fire. So know? did you and tell both the Coast Guard and Parry officials that you you left men in the pipe alive? I I I told I I did not see the Coast Guard arrow, right? I told a parrier official who was there assisting me in, um, in, in, you know, comforting me, asking me if you're good. And I tell him, boy, do ask me that. I'm not good. Men in the pipe. Get a man. If I can go, get some simple green. That's a, that's a, 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 a chemical to clean oil off here. I said, get some of that. Let me get that and let me go back in. Because I'm looking like I'm not going to get him. Let me go back in. All right, and Andrew Parry was Chris, he relax, he relax, he relax yourself. Um, you in shock? I said, What shock you talking about? I know you know shock. Men inside the pipe, go and get them. I tell them, I'm coming back for them. Go and get them. Yeah, we, we go in, we go in. You don't understand what's going on, but we go in, we go in. I said, How do you not do understand what's going on? All this time is, is, is they being restricted to going, you know? I didn't know that at this time, I was just serious. That I'm not supposed to have to beg people to go in and see if somebody <clears throat> is logical to think after our past men died. That, that was logical to think that at the time, you know. But when you see me come out of water and I telling you people living inside it, that's that alone supposed to change everything. <coughs> that's supposed to change everything. You keep saying, suppose, you didn't get the impression it changed people's mindset at all? No. No, because after after um, the whole ordeal was done and thing, and I was able to see Paria, um, the, the board in the command center, that was right down step by step. Right? When I came out the water, they didn't say Okay, Christopher Bojam retrieval, right? And we resume and rescue. It didn't have that on the board. What was it on the board? Slim chance of survival after I coming out. Nothing was slim about those fellas' survival. Surviving, nothing. Them fellas supposed to be outside here with me, getting an interview. All are we together here? Nothing, nothing was slim about it. Every single one of them supposed to be out here. Every single one of them, and nobody can tell me nothing different. So this event board clearly was was doing, I guess, what the officials were thinking were what was happening. So when you came out, did they put Christopher Budram retrieved alive? at six or whatever it is and saying they are men alive or or did they, or, or what what actually was put on the board was what you said slim chances after you came out yes after i come came out possibility of surviving slim chance did you tell them you were speaking to the men and they were alive yes you yes before was, you heard their voices I, yes yes andrew farah did ask me, he said, them fellas living, I said, all of them, they inside it, they live it. Right. So what's, what's going through your mind at this point? I wanted to go back in the water and you tell me, Chris, don't worry. You don't understand what's going on. You're in shock. But we will go for them. We will go for them. After I, I cuss Michael and tell him, yo, go and get a fin father. He 
he get just and he jump in the water. At this time, I told the, the, the paria official, I can't remember his name or his position. Kakarabeli, see who I was talking to, right? I told him to call my wife. And he asked him, where's the number? I give her his number. I give her her number, right? He called her. And I was on the phone with her and I said, babe, they tried to kill me here, girl. They're taking me to San Fernando General Hospital. Meet me there. I know she's a nurse there. She'll be able to meet me there. And right after that, they, they drive off with the boat and they came into the ambulance. I had to wait for the ambulance to come on, on, on shore. When the ambulance came, they strapped me up and they came straight to the hospital. So despite it taking until after 6 p.m., for you to come out, there was no ambulance on site to deal with an emergency of potential survivors? Not not on landing stage where I was. They will have to wait at least five, I think all 15 minutes I waited. Was was there were there Coast Guard medical officials uh, on shore when you got to shore? No, no medical officials, nothing. Uh, because of the amount of oil I had on my, my skin and thing, for for them to put on the on the, the rack to carry me up the step, the step is a steep one on the jetty mm -hmm. from the from the platform to the to the top of the jetty where the ambulance is. I was only skating off, so I was like, you know what? I could get up there now, and I end up popping up the step. You know, with assistance of somebody, somebody I sure might have been holding my hand, and I hopped up, and I went in the ambulance and lay down on the, on the tree, and they stapled me up and carried me. With, in addition to the, the your colleague's son, by that time, other family members would have gathered at the scene. Well, yeah, all of this was, that was known to me after in, in, in the... the so you didn't, see any, you didn't see any of the other family members there? No, no. The, the so you mainly, at that point to stamp another general? Yeah, I, I was. What, what, what happened to you at that point? Because at that point, I guess, the, from my memory, the families are still begging the officials to go back in the water because if Chris came out alive and Chris is saying that the others are alive it gave them even more hope i would presume yeah. that's a medical thought process i would think yeah yeah um well for me i was i was i was watching everything listening to everything i was going on around me until i reached the hospital my wife meet me there and she said babe i'm here and um well, after she there, I, I tell myself I can relax now, you know, whatever that to do, whatever that I ask, whatever to go on, I know my wife will seek my best interest. So I just relaxed, you know, and, you know, I was kind of in and out. They, they gave me painkillers and they gave me things and they started treat me. Um, what injuries did you sustain officially? Um, I had a, a fracture to the skull, um, severe tissue damage on my left hand to my shoulder, severe tissue damage to my ankle. So you're in the hospital now and you're overnight. The country is getting so many mixed bits of information that but from where i said we're not sure if a rescue is still on or if a retrieval is on what were you hearing bro my wife had my phone my brother and my wife they didn't want me to be um to breast with what was going on because they know the nonsense was going on but i know sorry i now realize that I now realize that, um, that these fellas are here with me yet. Something had to be wrong. I tried getting up and taking out the, 
the the drips and whatever apparatus they had on me to come out to discharge myself from the hospital to go and try to rescue them because I realized like nobody not rescuing them. I fell to the ground. The nurses picked me back up. Tell me, Mr. Bujam, you can't move yet. You got the strength. This is the one. The two. Um, we start inquiring about um, hyperbaric treatment for me. Because when I do the mats at 60 feet down there, um, there's a possibility I have in bends. Um, I, I give my wife instructions to talk to the leading dive specialist in the country, Dr. Iam, Dr. Coombs. He was in communication with my wife and the hospital. And an ambulance was supposed to pick me up from San Fernando to carry me to the library at Hull Support compound to get hyperbaric treatment. And I don't know, the ambulance who like the one like Paria just tried for me to die. I don't know, that was going through my mind because the ambulance supposed to come for 7 o'clock, didn't come for 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock we call them, they said they're on the way, 9 o'clock came, they didn't came, 10 o'clock they came. At this time, they put me into a COVID room, the hospital put me into a COVID area, saying that I have COVID, and I told them I don't have COVID, that's with residual COVID, because I now recovered from COVID, that they're picking up. My brother had to go and do a private test to get a blood sample. We give it to my brother and the private test come back negative. They were willing to release me from the COVID room. But the ambulance, paria ambulance, say they, they, um, they don't move COVID patients. They don't deal with COVID people. And they, not, they didn't work with any PPE. My wife was able to get PPE from the hospital to lend them. To receive me to carry me to the to the hyperbar treatment half past 12 or something like that reach my wife called dr combs explaining to him what going on and he did the calculations and he said ma'am you're nothing to worry about anymore if christopher had a chance again bends and it would have been detrimental the time frame to do anything gone and you, and you would have been showing symptoms of bends already Yes, I would have been showing symptoms of Benz and the time frame would have gone. Something would have happened to him. So if I did have the Benz, I would have died. Oh, but you didn't, but you didn't fortunately. I didn't, unfortunately. Maybe now, because uh, of the, 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 the information we have is that Paria on the 25th of the day itself issued their first statement outlining the incident involving private contractors, LMCF Limited, uh, during an underwater maintenance exercise at number 36 Sea Line Riser on Bullet 6 at Paria Trading Company Limited, Point of Pier. Uh, the company issued an update on February 26th, which is the day after the Saturday around 3 p.m., uh, and another update at 3, and then uh, an update following your rescue. Uh, and another at 5 p.m. At 6 p.m., there was an update advising of a media briefing at 7.30 p.m. Of course, at, at that point, at that media briefing, the Sunday, Paria chairman indicated divers were presumed dead. So were you getting this information uh, from your wife or anyone else? No, or because, no because I was, um, I was in a mess. I was mentally drained. I was, you know, my body peeling all over. I was um, emotionally damaged badly where I was, you know, in and out tears, you know, vex, by a lot of vexation, a lot of emotions were just coming out. So by Sunday when you don't see, or Saturday night into Sunday, when you don't see your colleagues arrive at the hospital, what was going through your mind, if anything at all? I was big and uh, uh, I was understanding what may have been the outcome because I knew that air pocket, the air 
in there was not able to sustain human life for so much of days, you know? So, I was frustrated. I was begging to be discharged. I tried getting up more than once to discharge myself, but I was not the physical strength to do it, so I could have just get back on site and go back down for them fellas. Because I didn't have the information of the media, I didn't know what was going on to know that Paria stopping divers from rescuing Paria, Paria and the Coast Guard, you know, putting out LMTS workers. All this time, certain LMTS workers wasn't able to go into the, onto the job site. Some of them were getting put off the job site when they, when they started, you know, argue or quarrel for to be able to do something, you know. It was always, they were working out a strategy and then, then this um, IMT room working out a strategy and and hold on and hold on and then all of a sudden they get a message that it's too late. They're going to cap off, cap off the pipe. No more rescue. They need to figure out recovery. So why did, did, why did you think those men, given what you know of the air quality and what you went through, could have actually survived past Saturday into Sunday? Yeah, but they would have a lot of... Um, when, you, when your body go into... To, how to put it, survival mood and the energy and things go down. It has used less oxygen, it has used less of everything. So, yeah, but they would have be unresponsive, but alive, you know? But what, do you think I, was the window, what do you think was the furthest window that they could have actually been alive? Monday. You think they could have survived in that from Friday to Monday? Yeah, but I say not too because I saw the, the autopsy results. To be honest, if I didn't see the autopsy results, I would have said by Sunday for the longest. You know? And remind us what the results said. Well, um, the results say that Rishi Nagasa lived until Monday. Um, Kazim, not Kazim, yeah, Kazim, Faisal, and Yusuf lived until Sunday night, from around 9 10. About this, so, yeah. you telling me from Friday evening to Sunday, you can have a proper rescue? LMCS came out and showed. Whole set of different rescue plans, but Paria rejected it. The calling Paria, the calling LMCS, the dive specialist, but they rejecting their rescue plans. All right. Whole support, a whole set of things, chin dive, and to cheat different companies came with all different type of equipment. You had everything you needed. And still, they say it was too risky. I damaged. Understand the maths in the sense? I damaged. My hand damaged. My foot damaged. I've been through the accident and I was able to traverse my way through all the obstacles and come out alive. And you tell me a strong, able body, healthy diver I couldn't go in there and rescue them fellas? How that making any sense? How you, as a manager, could stand up and watch this country and see that it was a great risk by sending in a rescue day. Men was volunteering to go, to go in and save my colleagues. Men was volunteering because men, if a boy, if for a boy to say, for individual to say, boy, I will go in there and save them fellas because they know for the experience they have and the capabilities, they can do it. Because nobody will never volunteer themselves to go in somewhere where they're sure they're going to die. 
the, the odds must be on the voluntary, stay on the volunteer side. I, as a, if I volunteer myself to save somebody, it's because I must know I could do it. <clears throat> you have at least four volunteers. And you tell them, man, no, you have no diving experience as a, as a, a manager. What about the Coast Guard advice? The Coast Guard advice that, that they have no experience in diving inside pipes. They don't only do open water dives. So they had no experience in this. And they made that clear in the COE, COE, COE also. They made that clear that, listen, we didn't tell them that it's an impossible rescue. We told them that we were not equipped or have the experience to handle that type of rescue. That's what the, that's what the Coast Guard said in the sea. Now, I don't know if it went down some, or, some other way, but that was that, that, that is evidence. Are you, are you surprised by what you heard in the Commission of Inquiry? And if so, what surprised you the most? Piper. Colin Piper saying that who he could send. He, he asked him the commission uh, <clears throat> when the question arise to him. But who I could send to rescue them, the, them, them fellas, who I could put in the life in danger. And I don't know if you heard in, 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 in the inquiry that there's still ones because I jump up at the same time and see the man's son. And I had to walk out the, 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 the room because I had to get put up for the the, the, the proceedings. But I couldn't keep it in. The man son was begging to go in to save his father. And Mr. Lynch can point no way better than that. Well, think about this, Piper. If you or your son was in there, wouldn't you want to go to save your son or your father? So it had people. People are begging to go in there. You would go on live television, call him Piper, live television and say that he... He didn't want to put nobody lives at risk. You're not putting nobody lives at risk if somebody volunteering to go. You're still very angry about this. I am. I can never forget this. I still have problems sleeping. This is something living with me for the rest of my life. I can't understand how it is. People could let four men die. For no reason. That is how I see it. I see this as pure murder. I don't understand how it profiting. Parry to lead them fellas that I, I don't understand that. I, so I don't know what motivates them to make this, these stupid decisions and acting on it. Because there's not one individual alone in it. It's a team of them was there coming up with these stupid ideas. For my for my friends and them to be in the grave right now. You see how them fellas body came out? The swell, the black. They wasn't even retrieved decently. The power pig. A pig is like a something like the plug running through the line and forcing them out. And right after they take them out, the this clap slap back on the riser and that line went into production right after. Well, I think it may have been an uh, uh, investigation scene. So uh, uh, right after could be relative. Let's just say that. Cool. If you know what I know, I could tell it right after. Cool. Two days after. Well, I should ask you about that. Yeah, I um, was somebody pulling. I'm going to ask you a very difficult question. Why do you think your life was spared? Why do you think you came out of the cellar? I don't know, Abe. God alone. God alone is the one bring me out of that. He haven't revealed that to me yet. Some people tell me it's maybe to spread the message and let people know that God is real and He's true. And he's a miracle working God. And that's the only thing I could work at right now. 
to let the world know that God is there and he is real and he's American and do, you think do, part of do you think a part of that is that somebody had to tell the story of what happened in the pipeline? Well, maybe that too. Maybe that too. But I sure I didn't come out there on my own strength. God and God alone. What do you want out of this? What, what do you want to come out of this? I would like justice. All how I try to forgive them fellas and relax and not think about the servants getting some type of penalty. Like, at least not right. I need, what, is, I need what, is, what does justice look like for you? What do you, what does justice sound and look like for you? Chill time for so many for so many people who made these stupid decisions and financial compensation for the tribulations that I went through and for the families to know that their husbands, their brothers, their sons, their uncles, their nephews were Yeah, You're using a really strong word there. Murder, murder has a particular legal requirement. It needs to be intent. It needs to be planning. Precon preconception. I don't think it fulfills all of that, does it? No, let's have the front terms. Are, um... But making a decision. Well, it may reach a man's so lot, who knows, but making a decision. All right? But in stopping a rescue. Well, Where it could be. At? It could be negligence, depending on how the court rules. It could be negligent manslaughter. That's in our books. But murder, to me, is a different, has a different legal requirement. But I understand the the emotion that's wrapped up in this for you, because I mean, you you lived it, you experienced an ordeal no one should have to experience, and then your colleagues and friends died and. I mean, the country went into mourning and, and shock. So I understand you being the person who experienced this, who has to live with this, as you said. I don't know how this could come out of your mind. How, 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 do, how do you mentally, psychologically, emotionally move forward if you can? Have you been able to in any way at all? Um, I still work on it, to be honest. I still work on it. Um, there are certain things I still can't look at, still can't do. Um, but I do need do, do joy. I thank you for life. Eh? Let me don't get, get wrong with this. I thank you for life. But there are sad days that I just feel like better to stay in that pipe. Eh? Hmm. You think that it's yeah. that emotionally and psychologically painful? Yeah. What about sleep? Nightmares? Right, you. Right, you. I'd get that. I'd, just, I'd get like maybe about three to four hours sleep. Um, Psychiatrists recommend sleeping tablets. So I'd use it when I, only when I, I really, really have to. Last night, like every time, Every time I'm feeling sleepy, and every time my eyes go to close up, I just jump. Something just kicking me out of sleep. Something just... I just have to reach the, the exhaustion point where nobody just shut down. And, and that might happen like around 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and like about 5, half past 4, I back up. You know? So... You um, said earlier on that, that the company the company is not active. The OSH agency suspended the company's operation pending the final report from the Commission of Inquiry. Is that correct? Um, I'm not sure if it's the 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 the, the inquiry alone, but they say 
um, pending investigation. So I don't know if it's only the inquiry or more than the inquiry, but yeah. So operations at LMCS have been suspended. Yes. Everybody on the red line right now. In closing, Christopher, what, because you're part of the industry, you might be able to go back to it now, as you said, it's, it's very painful. What do you want to come out of this in terms of how that industry operates? But you must want I, to be better. I, I, would, I would like laws and legislations to be put in place for an individual who encounters this, that companies be held responsible for for not only when it happened but for after during you see during the space of time where you have to wait for inquiry to finish and then you have to wait to take somebody to court and all that kind of all that kind of uh, litigation and all of that in the interim of that this could be four five six seven years maybe more right something to be put in place to help the affected the type of financial strain I under right now is unbelievable, right? And it's not me alone. It's the families going through all us because they have lost their breadwinners, right? And there's nothing, nothing in place for that. Every time you go a safety briefing or safety meeting, they tell us sign all the documents, read all the documents, die the insurance in case something happens. Yes. What could happen to me? And my family from now till I I end up uh, getting some type of of um, compensation. What what could happen in between that time? That could be ten years from now. It's already two years past, and I can't take nobody to court because I'm waiting for an a, a inquiry to be completed. While these individuals eating lavishly. Or for this inquiry. Now the inquiry is needed. I'm not saying it's not needed. You understand? But in the interim of all of this, what happened to us? You you found you you find that provisions should have been put in place even while the inquiry is going on, even while the investigation is ongoing officially, to provide for the families, your family and the families of those who lost their lives because yes. they were the breadwinner. Yes. And to a safety but I kinda lost faith in, in 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 our safety system because I'm going through all of this whole this whole inquiry and, and this whole incident and thing I kinda lost faith with it. I think that our our safety system needs to be rebuilt. Needs to be implemented more strictly and the thing is, we are the employee, right? If we see something going wrong and I go to tell my employer, he may as well as fire me before I fix that problem because it may cost him money, right? So we as employees depend on the parent company who is, in this case, is Paria, right? Now, that's why Paria does have their officials on site to see if anything going wrong, right? And to make sure everything is working in order. But in this case, the people who was in place to see this didn't know anything about the job. So there was failure from the parent company. So they didn't know if any steps was taken and if there was the wrong steps they were taken. You understand? To stop. To stop the job. And me as an employer, in this case, it, 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 it didn't work out like this. It wasn't we as the employer. I see something and wanted to stop it. But me as the employer, as the employee, cannot go to the employer and say, yo, we're not doing this because it's dangerous. More than likely, they will send you home and get somebody else to replace you. So that is the parent company, which in this case is Paria. Is therefore, and it failed, they fail, the contractor fail, the contractor fail, right? <clears throat> and who paying for it? Me as the employer. Employee. 
employee, sorry. Me as an employee paying for it. My colleagues paid for it by blood. Christopher, uh, I want to thank you for talking to us. I know this has been a very difficult interview at times and uh, a very difficult period. I mean, what you described is you, that you went through uh, and survived and had to see your colleagues and friends buried and what their families are going through because of the loss of their loved ones is particularly difficult and challenging emotionally and psychologically. Uh, uh, my personal belief is that you have been saved for a reason. You know, I don't think anything happens by guess in this world. And I hope that you will find a way to get counseling, continue counseling. You said you had some counseling uh, in some way, form or fashion to get you through this, to make you as healed as possible. May not be holy, given what you've gone through, but uh, holy healed, fully healed, but certainly some level of healing and peace through all of this. Thank you again for chatting with us. Thank you very much for having me. All right. We've been talking to Christopher Budram, the lone survivor from what has now been known as the Paria diving tragedy. Uh, be safe.